Good morning. Uh, my name's Ed Montgomery. I'm the Dean of the McCord School of Public Policy, uh, and I want to welcome you to this uh, event on uh, data for the social good. Um, we at McCourt uh, have a long history of uh, being involved with empirical work and analysis of policies and thinking about what works and what doesn't work and how does society operate. Uh, but we're in a different age, at a new frontier, where there's data coming from all kinds of different sources that we never might have imagined. Whether you're thinking about information from uh, cell phones, whether it's information from Twitter and uh, the internet, whether it's text data, whether it's sensor data, uh, we're being inundated with data, uh, which uh, other sectors of the economy have been using for commercial purposes. Uh, we've seen some of it used in law enforcement and other areas. The use of that data for public policy, for thinking about questions of social good, for thinking about questions of access to markets and opportunities for underserved populations is a relatively new area. It's an area that we very much think uh, should be explored and needs to be explored, partly because we're a policy school, but partly because of our values of the institutions that we stand for. Uh, the Catholic Jesuit mission of Georgetown University talks about serving the common good. Our students come with a sense of drive of wanting to make the world a better place. Uh, domestically, internationally, that's part of our DNA. And so thinking about how to use this kinds of information for the common good is something that we, we see as a part of our DNA. And so we're building uh, something that we're calling the Massive Data Institute. Uh, it's not the Big Data Institute. It's even bigger than the ma that. And so we're doing massive data uh, to think about that intersection between society, public policy, and new types of information. And how do we use that kind of way to serve uh, the public good? We all know some of the challenges about using this new information. Legitimate privacy concerns, government intrusion, people worried about unintended consequences, discrimination, uh, being, data being used uh, to lock you out of health care. So the question is, as we think about this new information, how to think about both those risks, how to manage those risks, how to manage those dangers while still opening up uh, that information uh, to think about the future, to think about how to make life better, to make uh, people who are isolated, uh, make them part of the, the mainstream uh, to, to serve communities that perhaps have been left out in the past. We're very, very privileged to be uh, partnering with the, the Beck Center, uh, who is uh, the campus's leader in innovation and thinking about policy, thinking about making societal changes in different kinds of ways. And Sonal Shaw uh, is uh, a, a real uh, gem for us uh, to have and a privilege to get to work with her. Uh, none of this could have happened without Holly Gilman, who's just walking in front of me. Uh, you know, Holly, let's give Holly a, a round of applause. is really the, the, the person who deserves all the credit for pulling uh, all of us together. We're bringing you here today largely because we want to hear about where we could be most useful. What is the space? What's the intersection? Some of you are from data people, sources, have control of data, have data that you've got from your companies in a variety of ways. Some of you serve, are from nonprofit organizations who serve under uh, represented communities or isolated communities or uh, issues of, of the public good. Uh, some of you are re researchers. Uh, some of you are at the open government at different uh, federal, national, or state level, uh, city level. Uh, and so this is an, it should be an interesting mix, an interesting conversation. And what we're trying to get is an agenda, suggestions about where could we go, where can we go forward? What should we try, try and do? What are the partnerships that we can try and construct? The MDI is very much built on a partnership model. It'll be a partnership across the campus between social scientists and computer scientists, uh, between natural scientists, people in the humanities. It'll be a partnership broader than that, thinking in, bringing in the statistical agencies, other people who hold data, private companies, uh, et cetera, NGOs, all of them, because uh, we realize we don't have all the expertise, we don't have all the questions, and the issues are too important uh, to put ourselves in, in stovepipe. So that's what today's conversation is about. Uh, with that, I'm going to begin the, the, the process, and I want to first to introduce our first speaker, Karen Gornblu. Uh, Karen uh, is a, a, a longtime colleague. Uh, she is currently the Executive Vice President of External Affairs at Nielsen. Before that, she was the U.S. Ambassador to the OECD. She's uh, worked uh, on the Hill as uh, uh, first in the Senate, 
for John Kerry, uh, then President Obama. Uh, She served in the Obama administration, clearly. She also served in the Clinton administration at the FCC and at the Treasury. Karen really has worked on technology issues from both inside and outside of the government, and we couldn't be happy to have her to give us uh, her diverse perspectives on the issues that we're confronting here today. So I'd like to call Karen up and the first panel also to join her on on stage. Karen? Bring that mic way down. Uh, So so thank you so much, Dean Ed Montgomery and the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation. Um, I just think it shows such foresight of Georgetown to have created this new center. And I just want to tell you a little bit why. Um, In this political season, I think what we're witnessing is so much frustration on the part of the American people with their institutions generally and especially with government. And one of the reasons certainly is that they know that while as consumers, They have so much power in the little phone that's in their pockets. But as citizens, they feel powerless. Um, Here in Washington, if you go to the mall and you see those big block buildings, it's a symbol, I think, of how people feel about their government, that it's centralized, it's opaque, it's um, top-down, it's rigid. And um, it measures its impact by inputs, not by outcomes. It's completely different from the edge-driven, innovative, lean startup culture of the digital age, and people feel that it's really not working. And I think the academy has a critically important role to play in addressing this problem and rethinking what government needs to be about and what the civic sector needs to be about in this age. Academics helped, after all, to develop the theories of progressivism, the New Deal, deregulation, and now we need new theories, clearly. And you couldn't have anyone better to lead this effort that Sonal Shaw. I worked with Sonal years ago at Treasury. I've followed her as she's become an incredible leader in this space, and she's brought together a stellar team, including Dan Carroll, who's been a leading innovator in government and politics. Um, And I think one of the, the great insights that you have is that data should be central to the new approaches. And despite all the the talk about big data or massive data, um, there's nothing new about data. So I work now, I work for Nielsen, which is a 90-year-old company. They invented the idea of market share. They do market research. So data's been around. I think what's really new is that because we live our lives online, so many things are now available in digital form, and machines can read that data, and they can pre-digest it for us and help us make decisions. Um, so it's a little bit easier to act. And this is what we need to use data for in the government and the civic sector. Now, a key role of government has always been about data. The census is in the Constitution because it's such a critically important function of government. The economic report of the president was designed to really put the responsibility for job creation in the hands of the president. I worked at the OECD. I used to call myself the ambassador to data. Um, The OECD was created after one person laughed. (laughs) So the OECD was created um, after World War II as a a part of the Marshall Plan to get the countries in Europe, and then later it expanded to include other developed countries, to cooperate through sharing data in part. And that data allows them to learn from each other and to name and shame each other when they're not doing things that they want to do. The IMF, the World Bank, these have allowed a lot of macroeconomic uh, decision making through data. Now there's been a lot of innovation in the use of data over the recent years, but it's focused on open data. So President Obama's first executive action was to require that agencies in the federal government make their data available, and that's allowed incredible innovation uh, from third parties. Um, And then there are other efforts like Code for America that have helped local governments better collect data and improve service delivery. So finding and filling pothold is an often uh, cited example where people will use their cell phones to document where there are potholes and government has that information and they can go out and figure it out. But the next frontier is I think what people want to talk about today, which is how do we use data to measure and improve citizens' lives? And that's really hard. It's really hard work. It seems like it's not objective somehow when you think about what you're going to measure and at what level of governance. And so I think figuring this out is going to require political will, it's going to require smarts, and it's going to require capacity. Um, And we'll talk about this later, but by only measuring certain things, we're making decisions today. We're just not admitting it. And uh, now that we can, 
we, we need to measure the outcomes we're trying to achieve and match them against the appropriate input. So an example is in, in education. What do we usually measure? We measure the number of teachers, the number of students, the uh, graduation rates, the dollars spent. But what does that mean? Well, one of the innovative things that the OECD has done, and I think this is the reason this study is on the front page of the New York Times every other year when it comes out, are the PISA results for education, where they measure what are students actually learning, 15-year-olds, uh, in science, math, and reading across countries. And it's allowed incredible learning by countries of what other countries are doing and they've improved and um, it's been an incredibly valuable effort, but uh, it raises a lot of political issues. It's In the US, it's available at the wrong level because it's a, available at a country level and we make decisions at a much more local level. So there are efforts to get PISA for schools now so that parents will have the information at the level at which they can take political action. Um, in, in a country like South Africa, they didn't have the data, so they couldn't participate in something like PISA. So I think this raises a lot of the, the questions about how do you get the right kind of data, but, it, but once you get it, it's really valuable. Another example is in healthcare, where we were all moaning 10 years ago that uh, we all were measuring and paying for um, uh, um, procedures in healthcare and not health outcomes, and that's changed a lot with Obamacare and promises to revolutionize healthcare. Um, so Nielsen has been working a little bit on uh, glo the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development data, which is this new effort that the UN Foundation and the State Department have launched to try to get better data to get the sustainable development goals uh, working. And I think that'll be a real challenge and it'll be very interesting. And I think that effort will benefit from a lot of the work that's done here. Those are just a few examples, but I know that the the Beak Center is going to really give us all, all new ways to understand how data can be used to reform government and the civic sector to make it responsive to citizens' needs in the new era. I think they're going to help us build the capacity, build the political will, certainly build the smarts. And I know I'm excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion. So thank you all. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us look around in this audience and it's great to see so many faces that have been really integral collaborators. So I want to thank you guys for coming out today for what I hope will be a really interesting and exciting discussion. A few quick thank yous. Um, these events always look flawless and that is, uh, <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> I want to thank Yvette and Lauren and Crystal and Hannah and Sonal and the Beck Center for all of their help. So a quick round of applause for them. I hope that we can really engage all of you in a discussion today because one of the fun things about being at a university is the opportunity it allows us to think creatively about these issues. I am truly honored to be sitting with these people, some of the best and the brightest, really thinking about how data can be applied for all of us in our lives. So they're gonna kick it off with a few sort of introductory remarks about how they're thinking about data in their respective fields and then we're gonna have a discussion and then we're gonna open it all up to you. So the first person is Brian Rich from the Hive Project at the UN Refugee Agency. Thank you, uh, good morning. So um, I run a special project of the UN Refugee Agency focused on getting more Americans to care about and become involved in some capacity uh, to help address the global refugee crisis. And uh, there are a couple of there are a number of challenges uh, related to that, um, more and more each day, it seems. But uh, one of the big ones is, uh, if you look at the United States, we are a uh, woefully underperforming market uh, in terms of both political and philanthropic participation. Um, uh, maybe 10 million people in the United States actively give to NGOs. Uh, there are more who give to charity anonymously and things of that nature, but the amount of money that we've raised out of the United States to help uh, any uh, social cause or issue is only about 2% of GDP, and that number has been largely flat for the last two or three decades. We also have, as we all know and have talked about probably many times in other settings, uh, you know, a very limited number of people who participate in the political process, uh, participate in the democratic process at a local level or at a national level. So the High Commissioner and the Deputy High Commissioner uh, look at the Global Refugee Challenge and look at the fact that the United States is the largest uh, financial supporter of refugee relief 
operations around the world and the largest uh, host nation resettler or committed to resettling of all nations around the world. And uh, you know, we're barely scratching the surface of what is possible and what is needed. So they said, you know, figure out how to get more Americans to care and become involved. Um, when we did our you know, polling and we looked at all of the, the things, we saw an overwhelming amount of support for refugees uh, generally and an American role uh, taking a leadership action in that. We saw slightly less support for resettlement, but in general, you know, Americans are good people and want to help. Um, the problem is, is nobody will get off their couch and do anything. Um, and no amount of, you know, NGO, traditional cry and buy, hope and horror, sort of let me tell you a story about someone who fled violence or persecution or, you know, a child who has been, uh, you know, set up with a wonderful educational experience or in a camp is going to penetrate the general American perspective. So we came at this as uh, part political campaign, part consumer brand, part tech and media startup. Uh, in, invested in all of the same sophisticated data modeling capacity that the Obama campaign had and the target uses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a full-time data scientist uh, on staff, which is probably the only NGO that has that in terms of focus on engagement and activation. Um, and now we're trying to figure out you know, how to get people to uh, get off the couch and take action. And, and here's the, the two data challenges that I would sort of put out, um, and then I'll stop. One is, you know, we have this incredibly sophisticated data, but it's only through the lens of uh, what's going to motivate someone to care about uh, the refugee crisis or some issues that relate climate change, bullying, things of that nature. Um, but we're not looking at the relatively small audience or even those who are look-alike models of that relatively small audience of people who are likely to support a social cause. We're looking at what we call the other 300 million people in the country who are consumers and spend a lot of time and a lot of money on other things, uh, unlikely that we would be able to move them to become do-gooders, totally possible that we would be able to bring aspects of the global refugee crisis into a totally different frame and get people to take action accordingly. Um, for that to happen, we need to understand people much better on a consumer level. We can't do that alone with the data that we have. So when we go to corporations, instead of saying, please give us an insufficient amount of money to solve the global refugee crisis, could you actually help us get smarter and engage consumers at a much more sophisticated level? And they sort of pat us on the head most of the time and say, you know, it is really great that you're trying hard to solve a global complex problem. Maybe I can raise some awareness for you. Instead of thinking of us as a sophisticated political consumer media tech operation and going, wow, you know, if Uber came to me and had all of their data, or if Hilton came to me and had all of their data, I'd be like, hmm, what can I do with that? We need to be thought of in that way, and we need to work with uh, sophisticated consumer-oriented organizations. And then the second problem is the NGO sector as a whole, which talks about modeling and talks about data, but really only does two things, which are basic analytics. How much money did we raise? Not enough. Uh, and the you know, we're engaging everybody who cares in the country, which is still just look like modeling of the same maybe 10 million people in the country, and we're all cannibalizing each other. Um, so in some respects, that's a data challenge, but I'm not a data scientist. I'm an engagement comms uh, behavior person. Um, but it is a data challenge, because without the data, we're not going to get smarter, more effective, and we're not going to solve what I would consider to be probably one of the you know, largest, most significant uh, problems in the world, which is the global refugee crisis. Um, so, you know, help us figure that out. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Flowers from 538. Um, thank you uh, for having me here. Um, uh, my name is Andrew Flowers. I'm the quantitative editor at 538. 538.com uh, is a news website uh, owned by ESPN and ABC News. Uh, we've grown from two people at the New York Times, uh, Nate Silver and Michael Cohen, to now about 40 people. We cover politics and sports, uh, but also economics, science, lifestyle, and other subjects. Um, we consider ourselves a data journalism organization, and I'll talk a little bit about what I, I mean by that. Um, and my role on the site is two parts. One, I write mostly about economics and sports, but then I also help with the kind of back-end data science work for all our writers. I vet uh, the journalism, not for the pros, but for the methodology, the data analysis. Now, what do we have to do with data for social good? The reason for this uh, convening. Take a step back, uh, and not to sound too high-minded, but let's just take journalism writ large. 
at its best, journalism is, a, is you know, a force for social impact and hopefully social good, right? You're presenting information, you're, uh, you're doing reporting, you're um, uh, telling stories that hopefully spur change. Okay, uh, and, and I don't mean this just in the kind of, you know, uh, holding power accountable sense, like Watergate, but also something more granular and very human. Like last year, the Pulitzer Prize for a, um, Public Service went to a, a small South Carolina paper that wrote about domestic violence in the state. So that's journalism at its best. It, it doesn't always live up to those ambitions, though. But 538 is a data journalism organization. Now, what do I mean by that? One of the shorthand ways we, uh, we define data journalism um, it, it is social science on deadline or empirical social science on deadline. Now, let me walk that back, because we're not claiming we're the equivalent of, of an economist or a sociologist or a political scientist, not at all. But to what extent can we write stories about the news that involve original data analysis that can maybe get you 80% of the um, bang for the buck of an of a academic approach, but in only 20% of the time? That's kind of like what I would define as data journalism. And, and that has pitfalls, and it's hard, and um, it, it, again, it's not a replacement for this uh, sophisticated academic type work. But data journalism can thus have a really important impact for social good. So if journalism as a whole is doing reporting and telling stories, what's the role for data journalism specifically? So that's what I want to talk about. Um, uh, what are the kind of main takeaways I found in the kind of two years at 538 for ways that you can amplify our data journalism, our work, um, to, again, make a, a positive impact, uh, to spur, you know, uh, to, to create social, social good? Um, so there's three takeaways I have. Um, and they're going to move from the most technical to the most kind of human and least technical. And actually, as I go along, it's going to get more difficult. And that's one of the, I think, important takeaways here is that this is not just a technical engineering problem. It's actually much more complicated. So the first most technical is sharing data. So beyond just writing data journalism stories, one of the things I think I'm, I'm really proud of us is that on our GitHub page, and GitHub is this kind of data and code sharing platform github.com slash 538. What we do is for hundreds of stories, or dozens of stories, uh, I'll correct myself, we've presented, hey, here's a link to the story, but the underlying analysis, here's the raw data, here's our code, here's uh, you know, ways that you can reproduce this. And so this is not just a, a way to hold us accountable to make sure that you know, we've shown our work, so to speak, that we're transparent. It's also a way to amplify our work, because a lot of times you would, you would not believe uh, we're having kind of uh, people who are enthusiastic open source uh, data scientists and developers taking our work and then building off of it. And that's, that's really incredible. Um, that involves, you know, I hope, hopefully we set an example for other academics and policymakers and other organizations that do uh, uh, data science work um, and that they not only just release the data, it's one thing to, you know, make sure your data is open, that's great. But and this leads me to my second point, which is a little less technical, but again, more challenging, is documentation. And so one of the things we're proud of, not just on our GitHub page, but in our actual storytelling, is that we have both uh, a clear explanation for how we go about our analysis, not just to allow for reproducibility, but to allow people to understand data. And that's the hardest, that, when, I, when I think of a bottleneck, it's, again, it's not an engineering or a technical expertise bottleneck, it's how can we communicate and break down silos? That's one of the things I think we're gonna talk about here. And the way to communicate and break down data silos between, say, government agencies in Washington, for example, is not just that they share the data and release it, but that there's an actual clear explanation and kind of a universal data model, a schema, for how to interpret it. So what do we do? We put out you know, lots of documentation with our data and, and, and within our stories, too. Now, the third part about this, how do you really amplify our work, or, and, and what are the broader takeaways for anybody who wants to kind of amplify their data work for social good, is find a data hook. Find a, an actual engaging story to tell, because this, and this is the most difficult, is that it's not just about releasing the data and letting it run free and, and, and saying, look at this really sophisticated you know, code I wrote. That's not going to get you that far. You have to actually write about things that are either not written about because of the underserved communities that uh, just either journalists or academics or policymakers don't really address their issues. And we try to do that. And I can talk more about the stories we've done in those domains. Like, 
such as uh, where police officers have killed Americans uh, throughout the U.S., releasing that data. We did a story this weekend about uh, the rise of um, uh, uh, terrorism in France and the EU off the Paris attacks. Uh, we ha uh, have data on college earnings and uh, returns to different college majors. We have data on police residency requirements, on the abuse of prescription drugs by baby boomers, and I can go on. And we have lots of fun stuff, too. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We do a lot of baby names and NFL predictions as well. Um, so the, the lessons here, as I wrap up, are threefold. One, share your data. Put it out on GitHub. Share your code. Put it out on GitHub. That's technical, but that's actually the, the least challenging of the three problems. Second of all, explain what you did, and that's very hard. It, release your documentation. That begins to trigger a cascade of, of open source passion, of enthusiasts that can break down the data silos. And third, find a data hook. Tell a human story. Provoke engagement. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, Zach Markovitz from What Work Cities. Great. Thanks. Uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, I'm Zach Markovitz. I'm the director of city programs for What Work Cities. Um, so I'll go a little bit about sort of what we do, and then we'll get into the discussion after that. But um, so What Work Cities is a new initiative um, about five organizations coming together, funded by Bloomberg Philanthropies, um, and with the goal of working with 100 mid-sized cities um, across the U.S. to help them use data and evidence better to drive decision making, and ultimately to improve the lives of residents. Um, and so we're talking about 100 mid-sized cities. So this is uh, we define as cities between 100,000 and a million people. And uh, the reason why we focus on mid-sized cities is uh, in the research that sort of went around building this initiative, there was really an unmet need, I think both of you sort of touched on this a little bit, for um, how cities can, uh, how cities of this size can begin to take the um, data that's collected at the sort of the frontline level and have it tied to really key strategic priorities that are set by mayors, city managers, city councils, leadership and city government, and make that something that's tangible in order to uh, sort of systematically reach towards goals uh, to accomplish outcomes that improve um, residents' lives and improve um, municipal government in general. And we, you know, you look at a lot of the best practices that are coming out of you know, New York and Chicago and LA, and they have lots of resources out there, but it's in other cities around the country, in the Jackson, Mississippi, uh, Mesa, Arizona, um, Kansas City, Missouri, which are not there and are also doing incredible work, um, but uh, are looking for the how they can take that first step in taking all the information that you collect on a data, data level, um, on education, on roads, on uh, blight and housing and homelessness, and make it actionable. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, so I said there's five partner groups working with cities around the country. Um, and so uh, we have partners at the Sun Life Foundation who are doing really amazing work with a young mayor, Tony Yarber, in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, helping them uh, not only pass an open data policy of the first of its kind for a city, but also do the legwork behind it in order to uh, build up a data inventory, a governance model, and really set that, that uh, city forward uh, on a path towards um, making the data actionable. Our colleagues at the uh, Johns Hopkins University Center for Government Excellence are doing really, really incredible work with a lot of cities, but um, in Kansas City, Missouri, relatively advanced city in, in using their data, but they have this citywide business plan in which they're looking to have it trickle down a cascade into departments so that you know, individual frontline workers can see how their day-to-day -day efforts can affect the, the city goals at the end of the day. Um, the uh, Behavioral Insights team is a, a it's sort of a new, uh, new initiative here in, in the U.S., uh, helping to work with cities on low, what we call low-cost evaluations. So you don't have to wait to the end of a two, four, six-year randomized control trial to figure out whether a program is performing or underperforming or not performing at all, but you can nudge programs along the way, do tweaks, and figure out exactly how can we uh, deliver better services midstream uh, and make those course corrections. Uh, and doing some work in, in New Orleans and... Um, and uh, uh, Louisville along that lines. And then um, at the Government Performance Lab at Harvard Kennedy School, working with cities on how do you tie procurement and contracting to outcomes uh, so that you're not just renewing contracts year after year, um, but you can work collaboratively, um, like in the city of Seattle, um, uh, addressing homelessness. Uh, many of you may know they just declared this um, state of emergency on homelessness. Um, how do you work collaboratively, contractors, um, grantees, and cities to uh, achieve better outcomes um, to the goals that you're trying uh, to reach? So. Fantastic. Thank you. And 
and our final panelist, Laura Quinn from Catalyst. Uh, well, thank you, Holly. Thank you, Ed, um, and your team for what you're building here, but um, and also for this conversation. Um, so uh, my name is Laura Quinn. I'm the CEO of Catalyst, which is a data enterprise that was founded just under 10 years ago. And what we provide is we compile a database of the full voting age population of the US. So we maintain consistently uh, about 240 million individual person records. And then we try to append and enrich all of those records with information about people's civic participation and civic behavior. And we provide access to that data to progressive organizations, which includes hundreds of organizations that are working in the political arena, campaigns, those kind of political parties, um, but also uh, not-for-profits, issue advocacy, advocacy organizations, think tanks, increasingly universities, um, other foundations that are doing research around civic engagement and, um, and advocacy. So we're a lot like the large commercial data compilers like Experian or Axiom who are compiling people's commercial behavior. They're collecting all of those swipes and all of those payments and all of those times that you're online and you're shopping in order to be able to better understand you as a consumer and understand what you might purchase next um, and how to talk to you really meaningfully about shopping. Um, <laughs> What we're trying to do is, and you know, have a long-term relationship with you um, <laughs> in terms of your shopping. What we're trying to do uh, is compile um, a set of information that helps us understand people uh, in the way that they interact with their democracy, and how they participate, and what they care about, and what kind of actions are meaningful to them. And then the organizations we work with use that to hopefully try to talk to people. Um, about the way that they are thinking about their government or they're thinking about um, the way that they're represented, they're thinking about who can best represent them and all the other kinds of ways that um, people hopefully are thinking and participating in, in this democracy. So one of the things, I'll, I'll give you just a few observations from 10 years of doing this work now that I think are instructive. And then I'm very interested in this conversation and the people in this room because um, I think that the attention around the use of, of data for the purposes of civic engagement and issue advocacy and even governing um, is lagging far, far behind what's happening on the corporate side around shopping. Yep. Um, and that's a bit tragic. And I do think that uh, you know, greater engagement across disciplines around how to accelerate the use of data for some of the purposes that my fellow panelists just outlined is of critical importance. Um, I think that uh, one of the observations I'll um, share with you is that when this kind of data sort of came in large measure into the political space, the easiest things to ma measure are tactical. You know, everything becomes a question of how to make the work you're doing a little bit more efficient. Mm -hmm. So the data is immediately trained on questions of efficiency. Um, but that sort of begs the question of what, are, what is the nature of the problems that we should be solving for? Uh, is that a question, are, are all of our questions about improved efficiency? Or do some of the questions that we want to solve for um, uh, are they measures of something different? And that's very difficult because efficiency is often easily measured in the form of dollars. Um, and if we make the data purely in service to those types of questions, we're going to end up with you know, one set of policies and activities. So there's a creative or a less quantitative uh, exercise that has to happen on the front end of any use of data, which is, what is the problem that we're trying to solve for? And then you bring the data scientist and the data to bear, and they can add a lot to helping to solve that problem. But are we asking the right questions? So that's, so that's one thing. And in the political space, it, often being more efficient in your advertising is less important than being persuasive in your advertising. I'll tell you that in the political space, nobody wants to put a dollar back in their pocket. Hmm. 
You know, they're willing to mortgage their house and their children to win a campaign. <laughs> so the, the efficiency question is less important than the am I actually moving people, persuading them, causing them to change their view of the world or their view of their government. Um, so that's just one example of what I mean by are we solving for the right questions before we're bringing the data to bear. And then on the other side of the equation, I'll say that um, I was uh, 10 years ago uh, had been in uh, the you know on the Hill and in the White House and lots of different places in this city, and I was a huge advocate of bringing more quantitative um, methodologies to bear inside a space that seemed to be a little bit lacking in that. Um, now I'm tilting a little bit back in the other direction. There's been such a fascination, at least in the political and advocacy space, with data and with new quantitative approaches, that sometimes we lose sight of the fact that it has to be blended with qualitative understandings that are not easily contained in the data. Um, interpretation of data is, there's a great deal of subjectivity that is part of that. So compiling the data, an engineering exercise, interpreting the data, not always as completely quantitative as we would like to imagine that it is. Um, and in that respect, I often, um, talk about the kinds of models that are being built in the political space right now that are look-alike models. Give me a model that tells me who, my, who are likely to be like my the supporters that I have already, for example. The databases themselves so far don't include as much of the granular nuance to mm -hmm. capture all of the interesting ways that um, humans behave. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know there's some folks from Google in the room. You know, that may be changing and it may be you know, in the future, something that is, in fact, more even more uh, able to be attacked from a quantitative pr point of view. But right now, there still is a lot of sub subjective interpretation that needs to happen. So bringing the quantitative uh, scientists together with the qualitative scientists to create the right context for the way that da data is interpreted on the back end um, is, I think, another very important um, uh, consideration. And the, and the one last, I, I wanna just, the one other thing that I see is, in, at least in the political space and in the governing space, there's a lot of data that's assembled for the purposes of this campaign or this issue fight. Um, there's less longitudinal data. Um, you know, with the exception of the census, many of these other data sources are not being built to understand change over time. Um, and people's condition when they're participating in one way versus their condition, you know, several years later when, they're, when their um, participation is changing. So that longitudinal aspect, I think, is very important. And we, from our point of view, we have been compiling data longitudinally very aggressively since the start, and we are now seeing the ability to look back over a decade of participation understood at the person level as opposed to the geographic level. And we are, in fact, seeing um, uh, n new insights and, new and better ability to predict where people are going in the future because we can see better how they have changed in the way that they're participating and interacting over time. So I think those are a few observations and um, I, I hope that uh, the people in this room are all gonna sort all those, all of these problems <laughs> out. <laughs> well, let's just do a quick round of applause for these great introductory remarks. Um, I think you guys uh, now all see why I'm so excited to have this discussion. I think, uh, you know, Karen's comment actually became sort of an overarching theme of what I'm hearing, which is this tension between how we think about the consumer versus the citizen. And where we see consumer data, consumer analytics, that's the stuff that we see in our lives or we don't see. Sometimes it's invisible, but it's there and we understand how to use it. And then the people up here are thinking about a very different conception of how an individual relates to the state and where data can play a role in that. And so each of the panelists in their own capacities are thinking about this question. How do we actually take data and translate it into improved policy outcomes? And you know, as Andrew mentioned, this question of silos and to Laura's point about why we don't see more longitudinal data and looking holistically at an individual, I think these questions are actually related. So I wanna you know, jump back in. Andrew, do you wanna sort of kick it off about how to think about this? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so on the issue of, of data silos, I think you know, this is something, um, 
we're struggling with. And by we, I mean users of data trying to interpret the, the different schemas from using Census Bureau longitudinal data to uh, uh, it, you know, department specific uh, data sets from data.gov or whatever. And <clears throat> one way to think about how to overcome it, it's not a panacea by any means, but is pushing for open data actually starts within the agencies that are trying to use it. So I've heard DJ Patel, the White House Chief Data Scientist, joke about how when a new data set is released on data.gov, there, there's all these, or there's an API where you can kind of access a certain agency's data that they put on their website. There's all these, these hits from it initially, and they're like excited that the public's using it. And it's actually other people in the building. And it's, it's actually like other people in the agency realizing, oh wow, thank, thank goodness <laughs> that the public pressure to oh, release our data um, to anyone facilitates the use of it internally. Um, so if we can generalize that, if across different departments and agencies within such a big bureaucratic organization as like the federal government uh, of the United States or the UN or whatever, pushing for that data to be released publicly um, is going to uh, facilitate users within it to understand, okay, we need to make this more standardized. Um, that's one way to think about it. Another uh, additional point I, I will add to this issue of data silos, uh, one way to approach, one way to really spur change is um, through Freedom of Information Act requests. So this is a kind of a, a specific journalist uh, uh, lens at it, but anyone can submit a FOIA request. But uh, pushing agencies to release their data through FOIA request actually, in the end, triggers them to just say, let's just put this online and not to deal with the, it's just a pain <laughs> in the ass. If, if people are constantly asking for this data, and they have a right to it, and you, there's initial uh, fear that needs to be overcome, but once it's out there, it's out there. I'll give you an example. Uh, we did a story about Uber and the New York City taxi cabs. Well, the Taxi and Limousine Commission was very afraid to release triple-level anonymized data about taxis to study, like, are they serving underserved communities of New York? Are, uh, is Uber taking a, a, a market share from them? Well, it took years of like really arduous FOIA requests to get this data, and then we wrote stories about it, and other people wrote stories about it, and bloggers took the data and did even better work. Well, at this point, the Taxi and Licensing Limousine Commission just put, puts the data online. <laughs> they, don't, they don't have to deal with this work anyway. So that's my two points would be, releasing the data helps break barriers of silos, even just internally, because it, it forces a standard schema into FOIA requests and other pressure. Uh, I know it sounds kind of uh, pit bully, but like it's going to, in the end, make people want to, you know, release their data publicly, and, and that'll cycle back. And I, I would, I would add to this in sort of picking up on Laura what you said. And I remember when, I remember the pre-catalyst days and the post-catalyst days uh, of political work um, that I was involved in, where. Um, people within a, a, a shared sector didn't understand the value that came from sharing information. Um, so if you look at the nonprofit space, and you know, we did this, and I'm not a data scientist, so we did this in a very ad hoc fashion where like, I took two or three pieces of paper and lined them up next to each other and did some math the way like <laughs> my eight-year-old does math, um, <laughs> where we said, you know, Fundamentally, if you deduped all of the lists of the million and a half nonprofit organizations in the United States and who is donating, you would actually find that there are not, you know, 95% of Americans. You would only find about 10 million people um, because I'm on like 37 different lists, um, and I'm probably misidentified on a number of those lists because some include my middle initial and some don't, and some, you know, I've moved a bunch of times in my life, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's this fear in the nonprofit community that if they you know, share their lists, that someone else is going to uh, steal their audience and raise money from them, and then they can't raise money, and then they'll go out of business. Hmm. Um, first of all, that's a stupid fear, because at last check, I don't think that keeping yourself in business as a nonprofit organization is, in fact, what your mission is supposed to be. I think it's actually supposed to be to solve for whatever the issue is that's affecting the world. So, misguided fear in that regard. Um, but also what you'll find if you did dedupe the list and you compared is um, the people who overlap on those lists overlap because for totally legitimate reasons they care about multiple causes. And the majority of people only care about a limited number of causes or a, or a cause 
and it's directly tied to something that has nothing to do with the organization or the marketing effectiveness of it. It's because Americans particularly, but people in general, are very self-interested. And I don't think we're going to get to the point where we can flip this idea of how to look at humans and the behavior that they take and how to influence that behavior in at least you know, in my context, what I would argue is a constructive capacity. I would argue uh, the same is true for participation in democracy. Politics can easily be seen not as a constructive way, but it is ultimately about the democratic process. Until we get past the basic market challenge of the competition um, and, and people realizing that the thing that makes you successful is not because you hoard data, it's because you're smarter than the other organizations about how to use whatever intelligence you have. So I would just put the challenge to this group that I don't think the idea of siloing is actually a data challenge. I think it's a market challenge. And we need to come up with a way to uh, demonstrate the value that participating in a shared data environment offers, mm -hmm. um, and use the census as an example, right? The Constitution mandates that we have a census. Uh, they don't have to compete with anybody. They just have to get the entire population to participate, which is a monumental challenge unto itself. But at least they're focused on that challenge and not the challenge of being like, hey, uh, you know, apartment owners of the world, will you, you know, please let us know where people live. Like, they've eliminated that set of problems because they have a constitutional mandate to do it. I don't know that we can get a constitutional anything to mandate that people should share their information, but at least we should be out there saying, you know, you're still gonna be able to raise your money and convert your voters and sell your stuff uh, because you have a product that resonates with certain people but not everybody, so forget the hoarding and, you know, rise above. And I also think on the other side of the market challenge, you would put a lot of crappy things out of business where, I mean, there are just a lot of products that people won't buy and a lot of issues that people just aren't going to support. That doesn't mean they're not important. It just means the market doesn't bear it at the moment. So right. I, think, I think that's right. And I think part of it is, is that it's a political challenge, right? So it's not a Little technical challenge. It's also about how do you marry the technology that we have with the institutions that exist today. I mean, Zach, you must see this on the city level all the time. Well, this is I'm, this is sort of to get to a number of the points, sort of the efficiency, the, the sharing of data. It's, um, it, so yeah, th there's also this element that it's just making the case about why it's important to share data. People are strapped, especially in local government. You know, as budgets have been cut, people are asking them to do more. Citizens, we, we demand more services from our, our government than ever before and want it on our phones wherever we can get it. Um, and so these silos oftentimes come up and the sharing of data um, becomes just another burden um, as opposed to just doing my job and getting it done, um, where the efficiencies that can be gained from when you open up a data set and you find that the most people who are downloading it are the people in the department next door, the person at the desk next door to you who didn't know that you were collecting it to begin with, <laughs> um, is something that's extremely valuable and it's a case that is resonating, I think, as people are digging deep. I think these silos if we're looking at them, they exist in, in this context in a number of different ways. I mean, the most fundamental is that there's just like this technological challenge of old legacy systems where just hold data and just it's hard to get it out of them. That can be done at an individual level very easily. On a scalable level, it's really, really hard if we're talking about looking at it. Um, there's the department, department stuff um, in terms of making sure that the human services and the police are understanding, are sharing data in key ways that are reporting up to outcomes. Um, there's the sort of federalism issue, right? You know, local, county, state, uh, making sure they're being shared. Um, I brought up Kansas City before. They have four counties, right? Um, they have an open data consortium that helps that, but there's key data they need to share with each other. Um, uh, and yeah, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I do. Um, I think I think you're right, but I think we're all underestimating the. There's a there's a very huge cost of creating the foundation upon which a lot of data can be shared. Um, and I think that is a big barrier and why a lot winds up siloed. I mean, in the commercial space, there's a reason why the biggest, richest Fortune 500 company still uses an Axiom or an Experian. Because it's not worth the expense to them of maintaining databases of everyone on a wide variety of foundational information. 
because they're maintaining lovingly information around their set of um, uh, customers or account holders or whatever it is. Just the way the police are you know, aggregating exquisitely a set of data that's relevant to them. Mm -hmm. But associating it easily with other sets of data is vastly improved when there's a sort of a foundation upon which that can happen. It's almost like, you know, uh, uh, when you have basic, you know, banking structures underneath, that a lot more transactions can happen. It's a little bit the same on the data space. It was once upon the time the case that that foundational structure for a lot of academic research and for policy making was the census data. But the census data, because of, uh, restrictions on it and uh, the way that it's compiled is not potentially adequate to the task any longer to be that foundation of data. What needs to be underneath that allows people mm -hmm. to more quickly associate data is a much more robust foundation. Those foundations are being built in the, on the commercial side. I mean, the, the capacities that exist now in some of the large data corporations, I won't name anybody, the folks in this room can stand up and say, that's us. Um, <laughs> but that is missing, you know, for associating all of these rich pockets of data in an easy way and in a way that makes sense longitudinally over time. Um, people, you know, can aggressively get together and put data sets mm -hmm. together right now and come up with amazing things for the short term. But if we're really attacking this problem, we need to put that underpinning underneath. And if it doesn't come from the government, if it doesn't come in, in some form with a sort of expanded new form of the census, is it going to happen in academia? There has to be a place for that to And we're going to get occur. new silos. I mean, my, my question, right, we're going to get new silos, which is my, my fear in this whole data for social good conversation is that we have this robust consumer data set that everyone sees a market incentive to be a participant in. And then we have this significantly less robust because, you know, we're, we're dealing with grants and, you know, cities and things that uh, haven't seen the financial and market incentives to be involved yet. So we're going to have another robust system that looks at other things as if the 280, you know, million adult consumers in the United States are, you know, different than the people who request city services and the people who participate in the democracy. Like, there's a, there's a fixed, though growing, number of human beings who live in the United States. Why it is that we treat social good-related activities as a special class of human as, just, as opposed to just mm -hmm. another set of, I'll use the word consumer, but little c consumer behaviors, like voting is a transaction, requesting your uh, drain you know, outside of your home to be unclogged to avoid flooding in your neighborhood is a transaction, the same way as requesting an Uber is a transaction mm -hmm. that should be, in theory, associated with the individual citizen. Right, exactly. And so why we differentiate those, I think that is a perception problem. And I was, I mean, I was saying to folks, uh, and I joked about it when I started, but you know, corporations say that they want to help solve these complex problems. They, of course, support democracy and things of that nature. But they don't treat those of us in the social good space as uh, equals. They think philanthropy is like a nice to have in the world. And what I'm saying is like the kinds of sophisticated individual modeling data that we have around refugees will help you sell more stuff. So if we have information that would help you sell more stuff and you have information that would help us engage more people and solve a complex problem in the world, it's a win-win. So, but we don't even have the, we don't have a common rhetorical platform from which to build a data sharing conversation, let alone the technical sophistication or a government supported schema on which all this could, we're literally talking about different languages where they think like, yeah, voting's okay, but like, I'm not gonna make money on it. Or like refugees, like that sucks, but I can't sell one, so not in my interest. Like, <laughs> no, like the data, it, it's uni it's tied to the individual, right? It's universal. We're missing the rhetorical platform in addition to, I think, the technical platform. Zach, do you want to jump in here? Because I think you're actually articulating two different versions of how we think about citizens, right? One is the citizen as consumer, and the other is sort of the governance, the policy aspects, you know, where you're working in some of the work that you guys are doing to actually get the policies going. I mean, you're talking about 
cities across the country that do not have basic policies about open data. So before we can even get to the question of how you create the centralized platform, we have to think about the humans. And I think that's also Andrew's point about how we humanize this stuff. Well, so it's, it's basic Zach, capacity. Laura, and then Andrew. Right, yeah. and, yeah. As Andrew jumps in, I yeah. wouldn't say centralized is at all what I'm yeah. saying. But yeah, yeah. Please. Zach, do you want to? No, well, I think it's basic capacity, and I'll, I'll just be quick. The, but the, um, it's, you know, how do, one city that we were working with when we started with said, you know, we would begin this sort of data inventory process, which is just, in essence, is like, you know, what do you have? Like, what, what exists in your city? They didn't, the, the, the quote was that we didn't really even know where the data were. We have no idea what we have, what we collect on a day-to-day -day basis, right? That's a fundamental, like, point in doing anything, I mean, anything that we're talking about is how can we begin to then, then once you then begin to inventory and put that out, you can begin to connect the dots. Um, and figure out whether these issues are out there. So I, I think that you know that's a lot of you know a lot of folks want to get data out there for a hackathon or something that's going to like produce something cool, right? Taking a step back from that and really studying fundamentals, like how do we want to think about this? How do we want to use this the 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 piece of information we collect on a day to day basis? And then what do we have? And then how can we make that actionable? Right, and so Laura, I, I, to your point about centralization, so then if you have this and it's actionable, if it's not centralization, how do we think about it? So I'm talking about how, how does it get financed. Okay, yeah. that's There's a cost yeah. of even doing an inventory. Mm -hmm. So Brian is advocating, or maybe I, I'm putting words in your mouth, but I'll, I'll just use you as a foil that's here. Totally <laughs> <laughs> we could basically back, say the compilers and owners of this data are going to be private corporations. And the best that we can do is cut some deals for trading back and forth. But ultimately, the problem that they are always solving for is, in fact, how to maximize and monetize whatever expenditures they're making. Welcome to America. So if you can make the case that uh, there is a bottom line benefit to them providing data and providing the services around data to not-for-profits, then that's potentially the paradigm of the future. But I would, I would say that if we put all data and service first to how it can be monetized and then secondarily to other things that are not um, questions of, that are measured by financial gain, I, I think that's a problem. And what, when, when you say centralized, that kind of yeah, yeah. recoil, and, and recoil I want to explore at that, that. Because but, what we're talking about is there have been um, uh, whether you call them utilities or national highway systems or, you know, reserving part of the communication um, uh, bandwidth, you know, there are, there are investments that we as a society need to make in certain infrastructures that are not always completely defined by how quickly they can be monetized um, that enable advancement to come on many levels and in many spheres of the of you know, and where the, the costs of doing mm -hmm. some of what we're all talking about have to be borne somewhere. We could leave it all in the private sector and allow it to be largely defined. It's a little bit like what we did when um, television and broadcast media became the means of communication in America, you know, several decades ago. And that was largely left in private hands with a small slice of public television and public radio reserved for something else. Well, and that has consequences um, in, in many different respects as folks who, are, uh, who own the communications medium uh, seek to drive the bottom line. That leads to a certain kind of journalism, that leads to a certain kind of entertainment, that leads to a certain kind of co communication, it leads to certain kinds of access for different communities. All of those questions play out when a decision is made to, to allow a large, crucial mm -hmm. part of infrastructure to be privatized. And often, that creates a great deal more efficiency. I'm, but let me, but let is me efficiency clarify. always the question? Let me clarify. I 100% agree with you. We have I, to argue a little bit, no, no, so no, no, this no. will be yeah, dull. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> but what I, what, I want to what I want to differentiate is the idea of privatizing versus letting the market drive it. And I don't mean the market as in capital M market. I mean the, the semi-enlightened self-interest of all Americans. Um, there is a calculation that can be made as to what the value of sharing data would be. The government does it. 
uh, corporations do it, nonprofits do it poorly. Um, but the idea is that we have not established the value proposition for sharing data effectively writ large. Only the data people understand and appreciate what the potential could be. And by the way, I don't think we fully understand what the potential could be because we have a tiny sliver of what the data is that is available. Um, so no, I don't want necessarily uh, to you know hand to give Axiom the keys to the kingdom um, because by the way, like they're not great at all things data. They're best at the things that the market at its present, uh, you know, capital M market in its present case is most demanding of. Um, at the same time, if you swing it all the way to the other end of the pendulum, the government is not particularly good at you know capitalizing on or responding to market forces, and so you know the worst thing that would happen, right, is the uh, the slow and deliberate longitudinal focus on everything missing out on the opportunity. And I'll, and I'll put the refugee crisis as a perfect example in here. The high commissioner, who was at Georgetown about two weeks ago talking about this, basically said that the reason the refugee crisis in Europe is such a problem at the moment is because everyone was surprised that all of these people would all of a sudden start flooding out of Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan and into Europe. Why were we surprised? We were surprised because the people who have the data on population movements and the drivers of displacement uh, operate at the slow speed of thoughtful deliberation. And everyone else is looking at it and going, people moving, people moving. Like, those people are fleeing. Like, I, I don't know why, but I'm pretty sure like a boat overfilled with people is a problem. <laughs> So the standardization of those two things allow those two forces to get there. I happen to have confidence, naive as it may be, that we as a society could balance capital M market and little m forces the same way you're looking at short-term data when clients come to you and say, I need something to win you know, CD4, and someone else saying, like, I'm trying to get more people in the country to care about uh, gay marriage and support gay marriage, and I know that's going to take a decade because no rational argument seems to work, but I can soften the ground and then I can do it and then there'll be this and then the courts, blah, blah, blah. I and that will balance those two. I don't think the general population, and I say this because like we had a fight at dinner last night where some of the most sophisticated data people won't share their own personal data because they're like, I could be discriminated against. And I'm like, solve for the problem of that when we have that problem. Don't don't prevent us from solving the core problem because you're imagining something that is extraordinary way down the line. We don't even know what the problems are when we know all the data. We don't even have but the starting But I think starting part point. of the reason we see that is that there's a, a distance, a disconnect between people and the data. So Andrew, I want you to just chat a little bit about that and then I'm gonna open it up for questions about how you guys think about humanizing this data, which you guys effectively do very well. Because people don't understand these kinds of conversations that we're having right now. Yeah, so let me think of like a concrete example and we could to, to discuss how you both humanize data and, and what good can that provide to spur social good while also addressing this kind of uh, debate we just had here about like what is the obstacle to using data for social good? Is it this private public a dispute or something else? So a concrete example, and I'm no expert, so I, this is purposely just like a model. Let's use the Affordable Care Act um, uh, and the new data that's being uh, rolled out by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies. Again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert in healthcare data. But one way to think of it is, okay, there's obviously a lot of private data from pharmaceutical com companies, healthcare providers, personal medical records. Um, that's not going to be publicly released anytime soon. Maybe some summary version of it could be, uh, and, and that gets at this issue of is, is, the, is the problem that, you know, um, Cigna is not releasing certain information that would help, you know, some nonprofit better address healthcare issues. That's one example in this model of, of the Affordable Care Act. Another is, okay, so the CMS data is coming out. One way uh, to use it, we did, was to like, let's write a story on both like, where are the uninsured in America and who are they? Are they, uh, who are, who's falling through the gaps of the Affordable Care Act? Just as a kind of a very human, uh, personal story, a lot of this kind of, you know, uh, ACA talk can get very abstract and a lot of the data, especially on something as human as healthcare, can get very kind of disconnected and 
um, abstract as well. So we wrote a story about like where, uh, what percentage of the uninsured are those that um, uh, fall into the Medicaid gap? What percentage are immigrants, uh, legal or illegal, for whatever reason, that aren't uh, signing up on the exchange or being uh, uh, you know, provided for by Medicaid or Medicare, um, uh, and, and so on. That is, was a very human story, and like telling it with graphics and reporting really kind of hooked a reader to kind of, oh, this is interesting. Let's use the CMS data for, to, to tell a larger story. But I think, so that's the, that addresses Holly's question, and we can talk about this, but I think it also kind of talks to this issue of, okay, so what, what was the obstacle to using data to help either better implement the ACA or just solve the bigger problem of healthcare in America? What was the obstacle? Was it Cigna or other private companies not sharing their data? Maybe we can get some headway there, but like, Jesus Christ, the CMS had all this amazing data that they didn't hmm. even release until this year, and people could actually start writing stories off of it, not just from a journalism point of view, but nonprofits could use the data to uh, target, oh, where county exactly has this high, higher than explained uninsurance rate, it, why is it? Like, let's go outreach to those people. Um, that's public data. It just wasn't in a usable form or it wasn't really collected to begin with. And now as we see you know, the, the pressure, not just market forces, but the pressure for open data and disclosure is gonna drive these questions. And I think, uh, I think the real obstacle is, is analysis and openness. And once you get uh, uh, the data open and once you get a passion of either open source people or, or civic society groups to, to analyze it, that'll help solve a lot of the problems. Not to say that the public-private issues I, aren't there. I actually think the problem is imagination. Like, I mean, Laura said it great. Like, do we know what problems we're solving for? We're still solving for the problems that we dreamed up 20 years ago, and now we just have better data to go and solve a lot of those problems. What's the next set of problems beyond those that are present in our current day, the predictive problems? Where's the next refugee crisis? Where's the Where's the population movement in the United States going to create the next gap in healthcare coverage or what have you? And what does that necessitate from a data standpoint? Because it would be really nice for a change, A, not only to solve problems, because we kind of are deficient in that, but actually to anticipate some of these problems and be prepared before they happen so that we can, whatever, craft legislation or motivate uh, you know, greater civic participation, or just be standing at the border with a blanket and a bottle of water when someone who has fled unspeakable violence like shows up instead of being like, what do you need? Okay, that's gonna take like three days to get some water. Um, but that's cool because like last time it took five days. So like we're getting better, but like there are simple solutions to a lot of these problems, but we're literally, I think, using the data in many cases to solve problems in the past, not because of the availability of data, but because we lack the imagination to open up the conversation to the point where then we can push for data. Like, I don't know what data I need. Just give me all your freaking data and I'll figure out what I'm trying to solve for later. Like, what's the incentive? Like, I don't know what the incentive is. The incentive is I'll figure it out later and I'm pretty confident I'll find a way that it's gonna benefit you as well. Like, that's an, I call that the imagination gap. Like, we have an imagination gap. If we close that gap, it's gonna like unleash the, the forces of analysis and journalism and policy creation and you know political engagement and all things, we just like give us a chance to do what we're really good at and stop making these institutional barriers that exist. Like, dream it up and make it happen. That's, I think that's, that's what's a perfect way to segue into opening up. Please, so there are microphones there. Please introduce yourself if you want to bring. We could bring a microphone to you. Um, you know, and keep your questions questions and keep them brief, and then I'll direct different panelists to answer them. Gilda Ochoa, Youth Orchestra of the Americas. I want to touch on the imagination gap. The problem with imagination gaps is that Im imaginations can run wild, and therefore, by definition, you're always going to have a gap in bringing it to reality, but that's the way to go. So on the issue of imagination gap, one of the most fertile, it's a question and a statement, one of the most fertile research um, efforts that could be put to work right now and I'm gonna to touch upon the refugee crisis and what could we expect for the future and longitudinal in, um, po population uh, data in the United States is the aging of the US population. Those are gonna be the massive refugees of the United States. They're aging at a very rapid pace. 
And that is gonna create even more severe and predictable income disparities because the moment somebody re retires, their income drops to almost nothing. And there are no savings to protect these people and there is not enough health care to help them. So one of the major um, lacks of data that exists right now is human capital data for countries. Countries measure income statements, flows of funds, but they do not measure their assets and liabilities. And of course, the major assets a country has, it's its human capital. Probably it's, we inherited that from, from slavery. We don't wanna measure human capital because it's not nice. So the question is, could you think of tying together the longitudinal data that is gonna predict that poverty levels in the United States are gonna, are gonna rise violently over the next five to 10 years just because of the aging of the population and your refugee mm -hmm. issues because mobilizing human capital, both bringing immigrants in and probably retiring some people to places where healthcare is a lot cheaper and the climate is warmer in Central America may be a very useful intelligent exchange, even if it sounds politically incorrect. So can I, and I'm interested in, this. so there's a, you know, one of the sort of dirty little secrets of the United Nations and UNHCR is that they actually do have a significant amount of data that anticipates where emerging refugee crises are gonna be around the world. And um, we don't talk about them because it, it freaks people out um, and it destabilizes markets and political regimes. Um, so the reason that people were surprised is not necessarily because the, the data wasn't there, because I think there is you know, predictive capacity for what economies are gonna do, and you know, whatever, within certain margins of error, it's pretty accurate, um, but because the, the political systems and the economic systems are not operating at the speed of, of the of the data, or the sophistication of the data. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the human element. Um, we were talking at dinner last night, and this is, I'm interested in the city stuff in particular, like, you know, there are a lot of very interested, smart, progressive mayors who understand the changing dynamics of their population and are recommending policies that are uh, long-term advantageous to the success of that city here in the United States. Um, and then they lose their election and or the city council or whatever blocks them because the current political will doesn't exist uh, to understand that. Um, perhaps the greatest thing, the most interesting thing to me that I saw from a data slash political and engagement standpoint is the acceleration of the uh, gay marriage acceptance in the United States when you compare it to other social movements. Um, and I think a big reason for that was because it was much more strategic in terms of identifying the populations that had the, percent, the potential to be persuaded, marrying that up with uh, you know, the political cycle, the legal cycle, et cetera. And you know, so still letting the system play out the way the system plays out in the United States, we still needed legal protections and things like that to be created, but doing so in a way where it didn't kind of happen organically or with the whim of you know, whoever spends more in an election. So, to me, that was an example of, I don't know if it's data sharing at a kind of nerdy data sharing level, but it was a, an integration of longitudinal understanding of social movements and human behavior and political behavior with uh, real-time changing of social understanding and social appreciation of you know, sexual orientation in that case. And somebody, very sophisticated group, mapped out a strategy and had the patience to see it through understanding they were gonna lose the first handful of elections, they were gonna lose the first handful of court cases or whatever. That, that model of application of data intelligence in the real world, I think is the part that's missing. Not necessarily we lack the data to know that lots of people are gonna be in poverty or lots of people are gonna be subject to political blah, blah, blah. But then you take like a 538, like 538 as a journalistic organization doesn't get the opportunity to help influence the social change before right. they are maybe better at being responsive and more intelligent and more precise, but like what is gonna happen in the United States politically over the next year? Um, somebody probably predicted some aspect of this a while ago. Laura's data probably has, she's gonna be like, told you so, like on <laughs> like November 8th of next year, she's gonna be like, 
should have listened to me. <laughs> Laura, um, do you want to jump but in? But no here? one does. Because <laughs> it's not there, like, in the moment. It's not the challenge. Um, yeah, boy, that's a lot of different concepts. A lot too. of different um, stuff. The, uh, uh, I do think that there is a lot of data available right now in different places that if brought together, it would create better insight for understanding large macro trends within the country and around the globe. I think that is true. I think that the capacity and infrastructure for bringing those data sets together in meaningful ways on a consistent basis across topics is missing. I think that it reminds me a little bit of, this is gonna be a totally icky um, analogy, but you know, science is scary. And I think about a few centuries ago when medical science was on the verge of important breakthroughs. And a lot of what enabled that was cadaver dissection. And <laughs> before society had gotten together and sort of looked that you know, scary, awful, yeah. creepy, you know, religious overtones that had all kinds of problems wrapped around it so that it could make rules for medical doctors and medical practices and medical universities, people in the private sector, rules for how you could actually find a cadaver, use a cadaver, dissect a cadaver, and what you could do about it. Once there are rules in place, and once the, the society has a better understanding of what this can yield, that enables things to happen in a way where it isn't a bunch of rogue doctors or rogue data scientists running around and digging things up wherever they can find it and putting <laughs> it together and seeing what they can come up with. Those rogue data scientists. Yeah. I know. <laughs> um, They're everywhere. Not to you know, compare you to this, but you know, those <laughs> doctors in those days were actually doing something amazing and they were creating breakthroughs in little places and little ways and demonstrating what was possible. But in order for science to really advance, that had to be done in a more systemic way. And it's hard to do things in a systemic way if there aren't rules and basic infrastructure underneath it. The infrastructure, my point, is that it is being created in yeah. the private sector already. Yes. Yeah. The private sector, I think Brian is right, I think is an enormous engine for you know, things happening faster and um, uh, with more energy and more potential imagination. And the private sector, I think, is probably willing to have rules that say you have to comport with these kinds of data sharing regimes, yeah. or you have to comport with these kinds of data privacy regimes if they're clear, consistent, that their competitors are being asked to do exactly what they're being asked to do. Then the private sector is willing to say, yeah, we would like academia and the government to have access to this data so that they can be worrying about some of these larger right. long-term problems right. where there isn't an obvious bottom line for us, but we probably know that if there was somebody working on this refugee crisis, it would probably be better for my business in the long run. And if I'm being asked to contribute to that in the same way that all my competitors are asked to contribute to that, we're in, yeah. which is, I think, Brian's point. Yeah. So I think these things are possible, but I am worried about having it all happen in a completely organic way and not really engaging the society or, you know, around questions that are scary and not letting it be completely driven by the emotion that it sounds like you were encountering over dinner, which is like, I'm not letting anybody see any of my data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got to get a little bit past that. We can anonymize things. We can protect people in, in, in reasonable ways. And then we can allow data to be br to brought together we can create infrastructure underneath the sharing of data that is enabled by the private sector, but is you know, um, also enabled by the government, yeah. and really start to get some velocity around using this stuff to solve big, big problems. Yeah. So I think, that boy, sense. is that too much? No, I think that's, that's <laughs> perfect. Let's take another question. And do try to keep it brief. We have so many things to I'm cover. I'm sorry, I was going to no, do no, that the side and then back to this side. Hi, Victoria Vrana from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A quick tactical question for Laura, and then a more, here, I'll stand up. And then a more general question for the panel that really builds off Laura's last comment, I think. 
The tactical question is, I know Catalyst has information about civic engagement. Does it have information, if you can share this, about charitable giving behavior of individuals? As I was listening to Brian, if we could just share all of that information. Um, yeah. So wondering if Catalyst has that. My more general question is along the ethics and privacy lines for the social good data space. And so, again, when you think about exchanges with corporations and things like that, are there special ethical and privacy issues within the social good data space, or are there things we can just build on from the corporate space that are already there already? I feel like in the social good space, people are just beginning to think about this, and it is a little more Wild West-ish than uh, in the corporate space. I want to turn to Laura, and then I'd love for Zach and Andrew to think about how they're respectively working with this really important question. Thank you. Uh, yes, we do. Um, not just giving, but activism, and I think activism isn't in, it, is, isn't in as many places because, again, it's not easily tied to a, a bottom line. And then I think in terms of the rules, I think that's part of the problem, that there isn't really a good set of norms for how to do this in an ethical way, in a, a fair way, in a sensitive way, all of those questions. And that's what this room has to figure out. <laughs> it it so, does so feel chicken egg to me because like, I've written rules for this. I mean, I have somewhere, literally, I have like three different versions of rules for the ways nonprofits and corporations could share data and different magazine companies could share data across, you know, Condé and Hearst and all that stuff. Um, and everyone's like, great in theory, you know, let's see it in practice. And I'm like, great, let's just like, you know, compare some data sets and we'll see how the rules apply. And they're like, nope, can't do it, need a set of rules. And I'm like, you just said we needed to like test it out so we could develop rules. Like, there's no sharing going on between corporations and nonprofits, for example, in terms of that kind of stuff in any meaningful way. Like, I'll take one, one, because I'm pretty confident we're not gonna screw it up as badly as everyone is afraid that we're going to screw it up, and then we'll get really constructive rules out of it. So like any corporations out there wanna raise their hand and like share some data with the Gates Foundation and us, and we'll sit in the middle, we'll put it in escrow, we'll let Laura do it and sign an NDA, like whatever that takes, one freaking example of trying to cross collaborate between consumer and civic engagement could transform the whole conversation. Laura, do you well, want to jump I, in? And I, we I keep guess, having a lot of problems. I think it is happening. It's a little bit like what I say about, you know, there's, there's, there's cadaver work going on right now. Um, but it is a bit haphazard, and I think people are coming up with their best rules on a case-by-case -case basis, which slows everything down. One university hospital bringing in a bunch of cadavers, just one, would be like monumentally game changing <laughs> in terms of the conversation. Like I agree with you, there is cadaver. We're we're trying to do cadaver research. I can't believe one, I introduced this. No, it's a great it's, it's a great a, concept. It's quite like a, one, we're doing one, not a whole institution, not a government mandate, not a massively funded project. Like one, you know, group that just tried it out, and if it failed, like we all go back to our corners. Zach, I think that would be game changing. So, I mean, I, I, about this, this is like a little bit of a tangent, but yeah, I, I think yeah. one of the things yeah, that yeah. Um, we've sort of been touching on a lot is just that the, this is hard. Yeah. Um, and, That's a great point. Um, uh, I don't know if it's a great point, but it's, I think it, it is. It is. It's true. Is, it happens to be true. It happens to be, it. Yeah, no, it's, it's this true. is hard, and sure. it's also hard in like yeah. a lot. There's, there's some good, there have been some good efforts on like a, let's say, a national scale towards this stuff. I mean, you look at um, uh, the, uh, the sort of, uh, uh, public transit projects, right, or restaurant reviews, um, the voting information project, something I used to work on, right, project, which is absolutely. which is connecting street segments yep. to um, polling, polling place, place information and ballot information, which removes personal identifiable information, right? You don't need to know who lives in a house to know that someone in that house goes to a polling place to vote. That's unbelievably hard to do, and it is built on the back of little the little stained glass. Um, uh, geography of America, each part of that participating on a standard in a key way. So that's both standard setting and its participation and it's changing the things I was talking about before about like pulling information out of old systems, getting... Combining with Google and their, their capacities. Right? Exactly, and it could be it could be Google, it doesn't have to be any, but it's, it's combining with private to use them as the um, the mouthpiece to get this information to where people are pulling from it for. So it requires everybody in this room to spend the time yeah. working between nonprofit, public, private groups, right. and constantly pushing about why and how can we do this better. Andrew, do you want to jump in about how you guys are thinking about this? Data, I don't, the short answer is Holly said this, 
it's this is a hard problem. Data ethics is underdeveloped, understudied, um, and I don't have a grand strategy to fix it. I mean, I, I, this is really difficult. So uh, a few points. One, education matters. Uh, I, we are at Georgetown, so I, I don't mean to indict Georgetown or any <laughs> area of higher learning, but if academic institutions are already behind in the technical aspects they teach about data science, how, why would you expect them to be up to date with data ethics? Mm. So it's like if you're already using anachronistic programming languages, for example, and backward looking approaches to data science education, why would you be at the cutting edge of, uh, of data ethics? And I, I indict my alma mater and I indict uh, the whole, stat this thing is changing so fast. So that's one point. A second point is it's not, it, it, all these conversations need to take it, into consideration the behavioral tendency of all of us, myself included, to choose convenience over privacy. And until you just come to realism about that, and, 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 and factor in the behavioral responses, the, the kind of opt-in, opt-out, nudging that should go with all our privacy settings, you're not gonna get very far. And then the last point, um, it's not just about de you know, you know, anonymizing data or de-identifying data. Uh, I wrote a story a few months ago, or about a year ago, about uh, a paper in science and how uh, algorithms and data scientists, de algorithms developed by data scientists can essentially triangulate credit card purchase information and, and identify people by name from their Instagram and Facebook and other geocoding uh, posts that are openly available. So you have these anonymized credit card purchases, you know the time, I mean these are sold by banks and other market research companies for people to do you know, analysis and supposedly it's safe, but they can find out who you are because you posted on Instagram at this specific geocoding spot yeah. and you only need a few data points and you can identify. So the point is, it's not just about like, I, you know, stripping uh, identifying information because the science behind cracking the codes of, of who people are is is getting better and better. Fantastic. Um, we are unfortunately we're running, out, running out of time. I want to take two questions in a row and then make sure each of the panelists have a chance to respond for final words. And we'll we'll move right into a quick coffee break so you guys can talk and continue to mingle. Oh, just very quickly, uh, Adrian Gardner, I'm the FEMA Chief Information Officer. I was a long-term data architect for data.gov. I was the one that ran around the country and got the first 47 data sets. Um, it's hard. You got to just start somewhere. And, and so anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. We're not where we need to be. I agree we need, need a lot of work in this area. My question is really around um, a, a lot of challenges that we face. We need to look for success because success has already happened. I also used to be the weather service CIO. If you look at weather data, oh, yeah. all of these challenges you're talking about have been solved, folks. Example. So let's look for the examples that are out there. So if you look at weather data right now, weather bug, AccuWeather, guess where that data comes from? The weather service. People often ask, why do we need a weather service? Because that's where the data comes from. Oh, by the way, those data standards are international standards. They share data. We share data with countries that we are, have, have aggressive activities going on with, whether they be, I won't name the country, but anyway, we basically, at the end of the day, we share data because at the end of the day, weather impacts all of us. A storm comes off the tip of Africa, comes across the United States. Do I want to know about that in advance so that I can be predictive, so that I can get resources in place? I do. So there are, there are successes out there, and we need to leverage those. So it's out there. Next question. Sure, new. I'm with the Center for Data Innovation. Uh, this actually dovetails pretty nicely with what he said. Um, so I absolutely agree that the imagination gap exists in the federal government, but I don't think that's the primary limitation. I think there are you know, political realities that uh, you know, agencies like NOAA cannot even if they're the most imaginative people in the world, they just cannot publish all their data. They collect like 20 to 40 terabytes of data a day and can only afford to make two of those terabytes available if they want to keep the lights on. So imagination aside, how do you basic, how do you, you know, create channels of communication? How do you get the kind of user engagement um, opportunities where agencies can, can, can talk to people actually using this data to understand their problems and pri prioritize the release of, of valuable data sets when they just simply cannot afford to, to make it all available. So this woman, do you want to jump in with your question? You've had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah. 
I actually just posted my question to Twitter, too. Good. Okay. <laughs> check that. Um, good morning. Bernice Butler from the Data Quality Campaign. Um, even when we're doing social good, who informs what is the social good? Um, what are the efforts to really get input from the people we're actually trying to solve the problems from? Whether they're people who are about to retire, whether they're homeless people, or whatever the need is. Because if we're all here in this room deciding what the social good is, is it really what's needed? And how do you control for that? That's a great question. And then the woman right behind you who's also had her hand up. And then we'll really turn it over to the panelists. Thank you so much. I'll keep this quick. My name is Neda with the Open Gov Hub. Um, I'm just curious to know if you think that engaging ordinary citizens in the process of producing and consuming the data could actually address some of the civic engagement challenges that we're all concerned about. Um, is citizen-generated data something that we should be looking forward to? Or is there so much data already available that it makes sense to kind of train ordinary citizens to better understand information that's already out there? Thanks. Well, these are fantastic and meaty questions. So I'm just going to have the panelists go down the line and do their very best. And then we will open it up for coffee and uh, you know, we can continue the conversation. So Laura. Well, I, I can only say that it's clear that there's a lot of people in this room who would potentially should be on this panel. Mm -hmm. um, I am so grateful that this conversation is happening. We deal with one little slice of what is so massive and gigantic, and you know, I pray every day that somewhere these conversations are happening. And if Georgetown is, you know, creating a way to have more of these conversations that are inclusive, that allow more input than just us, I think that is a, a terrific step in the right direction. Um, okay, there's a lot in there. Uh, <laughs> so we may have to kick you to Twitter. But um, the, so in terms of prior to, I mean, one of the things I think is key is just commitment, right? Commitment from the top, that there's a, an element, especially when, it, when you look at the city's uh, city level, right? Mayor, city manager says, like, this is important, and de departments, if you're talking about prioritizing data sets and releasing, do, you have to do this, right? This is a part of our plan. Um, in terms of defining social good, you know, that's an amazing question. I just have some examples to point to. Um, so uh, the city of Kansas City, Missouri, they model their strategic business plan um, on, uh, in part on a citizen survey they do uh, on a regular basis, right? So it's constantly like, how do, tell us how you feel and then we're going to build that into how we're prioritizing that. Oh, and by the way, we're gonna help, we're gonna set goals and we're gonna make market improvement towards those goals and we're gonna show you the data um, that we're, do, that we're doing to memorize it. So that's engaging, that's sort of engaging the citizen base in that whole process. And then in terms of the engaging citizen base, on top of that, I absolutely think there's some amazing opportunities to do so um, in both the cr creation or co-creation mm -hmm. of data around this. Um, and uh, look at sort of uh, Philadelphia, their open data portal, for example, is not just, it's where the city puts all their data, but it's not just the city's data, it's all, it's as many of the nonprofit community that they can, as well as the citizen-based data. And there's some incredible things that come out of that. Um, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, for example, they had a really interesting program which um, was with a partnership between the city and, some, and a local uh, organization where they put um, uh, air quality sensors on bikes um, and gave the, the city the information they needed to better track pollution issues uh, in the city and what neighborhoods were being most predominantly affected um, and, and how that related to the weather. Um, so it gave them the information they needed to act, uh, and that was really citizen collected data uh, working in partnership with the city. Um, so let me make a point and give an example to hopefully address these four problems. The point I want to make actually, uh, I want to end on a positive note, is that it's actually getting better, and, it's, and there's a lot of success stories. So if we're talking about data for social good, there's been a lot of uses of data for social good in the last five to 10 years, or even just the last two years. It's just getting better and better. Now, what example I want to give you uh, is it, to make this point, I think, touches on all four issues. Um, it involves uh, the killing of, of, of Americans by police. Uh, the FBI OCR data, the crime report data, the Bureau of Justice statistics data is terrible. It's shitty. I'm going to be honest. It's appalling. <laughs> It's embarrassing for this country that we have such poor data on who officers kill, how they kill them, As particularly for minority communities. This is a, just, it's a tragedy. Well, it's getting better. Who started this? To get to your point about, your two points about what is the social good and what about citizens being involved with data collection, 
The Guardian US partnered with this organization, The Counted, that started to actually call police reports uh, to the extent they existed, or newspaper clippings, and created a database of killings by police, uh, police officer uh, killings in the United States. Well, public pressure is growing on this issue, issue after Ferguson and Eric Gardner, et cetera, and the FBI is responding. Uh, to get at your issue about how hard and difficult this is, you want to talk about a politically charged issue, the FBI, uh, bless their heart, like what are they going to do? They have to uh, aggregate all this information across the US and, public, uh, and, and publicly put it out there and have people's careers on the line. This is tricky and it's hard, but guess what? Th there's a fire lit under them now by these citizen-created websites, databases, that are working with other journalism organizations to kind of create an actual data set that's addressing an issue that wasn't thought of as a social good for a long time. Um, so uh, I, I'm actually optimistic. I'm real, I see a lot of progress here, both in the government, data.gov. Things have gotten a lot better with city and federal governments releasing data. It's just, it's getting a lot better. And the citizen involvement in the journalism community, I'm proud to be a part of that, but like even beyond us, has gotten a lot better at telling important stories for all types of communities. So I think you should also congratulate yourself. Um, so, so here's the thing, I'm, I am optimistic and a general believer that human beings, and particularly those in a relatively functioning democracy, uh, will figure things out um, if given the opportunity to do so. Um, and so the caution that I would put on this whole conversation is defining success or defining social good in a way that does not actually allow for the system as a whole to function in the ways that it's sort of organically going to do it. Um, I realize it seems blasphemous, but I would almost rename this conversation, you know, not data for social good, but like data period because period. Like <laughs> we have data, we have the capacity to be yeah. smarter um, about all sorts of things. I have confidence that the ways that we would use greater data intelligence would be advantageous for, um, you know, people as a whole. But even there, I would go, that's not good enough. Like the concept that I have and the concept uh, that I try to hold, you know, everything that I work to is the idea of 100% participation. And everyone's sort of like, ha, 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 100% participation. Like, that's ridiculous. What would happen if 100% of people who are eligible to vote actually voted? We have no earthly idea. We've never come anywhere close. And, like, we blame all of our problems on a lack of participation. What if that's not actually the problem that we should be solving? So why don't we solve for every problem with this ridiculously high standard, shoot for the stars, land on the moon. Right now we're shooting for like just outside the atmosphere and we're landing like on the 14th floor of some building and it's not really <laughs> exciting enough to me. <laughs> so, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. Like we need to just do things, right? To Laura's point, I agree. We need standards and protocols and rules to do this stuff. We don't need ratified by 50 states, everybody agrees, signs on the bottom line, all corporations are on board. We need rules so that we can then figure out that the rules aren't good enough, go and do the next set of rules and the next set of rules. Like, we're a democracy. This is how this system works. If you haven't seen Hamilton, go see Hamilton because they do it in a like really cool hip hop sort of way where you figured this out you know, a long time ago. So to me, what it ultimately comes down to is we have to redefine what success means. In nonprofit and in everything else, success is about storytelling. Storytelling is bullshit. Storytelling doesn't actually demonstrate success. Success is completing whatever it is we set out to do. So I've worked in hunger. I think the goal for hunger is zero people who are food insecure. Feeding more people in the country is not an equivalent measure to zero food insecurity. We're not even reversing the trajectory. We're just excited that maybe we're, that hunger's not increasing at the same rate as economic inequality. Like, Ooh, what are we celebrating? Like, you know, su success would be zero cop shootings, you know, because there shouldn't be people shooting each other. Like, not fewer cop shootings or more justified cop shootings, like zero. So let's change the success and keep that as the standard for ways in which to use data to inform what it is we're trying to do. I'm not saying it's realistic, I'm just saying stop saying if we got 2% more people to vote, everything would be fixed. Go for 100%, maybe eventually we'll get there, but even if we don't, we're gonna change a bunch of different problems than the ones that I think we're trying to change now, which I would argue are probably not necessarily, in most cases, the right problems. That's fantastic. Well, a big round of applause for our panel.